And it's so weird. In the period of our lives when we have so many tools for connection, we still feel lonely. So it's really no secret that social networks have made us lonelier than ever. What they don't realize is there's entire teams of engineers whose job is to use your psychology against you. So here at Real Life English, we talk all the time about how important it is to know why you are learning a language. So my purpose for each of the six different languages that I've learned has always been really closely related to the friends I had that spoke that language. In fact, I was very shy in high school and getting into language learning was a way and continues to be a way for me to overcome that shyness. Just to give you an example, Around six months ago, I made a Brazilian friend here. So I used to be fluent in Portuguese back when I was living in Brazil, but that was over seven years ago, and I lost a lot of it. But over the last six months, my skills have advanced so much. I've gotten back to the level that I used to have in the language just because I made this one friend. We went to, to a samba here in Barcelona. <laughs> And that was amazing because it's just like, almost everyone there was Brazilian. You know, we talk most days, we share music, uh, series, and so on. So this has just been huge for me to improve my Portuguese skills. And stick around until the end because we are going to give you over seven tools that you can use to make friends both online and in person to practice your English with. We'll also teach you some great English vocabulary and connected speech with an impactful clip from Simon Sinek. And by the way, we started off today's lesson by playing a game where you're going to hear a lot of different English idioms. Now, if you want to actually learn these and never forget them, the only way you can do it is by downloading the Real Life English app for free, which you can find linked in the description or by searching for Real Life English in your favorite app store. Now there, you'll get vocabulary flashcards for all of these so you can study them and add them to your active vocabulary, all right? So, without any further ado, let's jump into episode 383 of the Real Life English Podcast. Aww, yeah, global citizens. This is Ethan from Real Life English, where every single week it is our mission to take you beyond the classroom to speak English confidently and naturally, connect to the world, and of course, use your English as the doorway to achieving your greatest life. All right, Ksenia, so I thought that we could start off with a bit of a, a game that's actually going to be valuable for our learners' English, and it's going to put your English to the test because I know you've been, you've been yourself studying more deliberately yeah. lately. So we're going to do a word association game. Okay. Basically, all you have to do, it's very simple, is I'm going to start off with an expression, and you say the first English expression idiom that pops in your mind. And then I'll say one, the first one that pops into my mind from that, and we'll go back and forth. So I have uh, come up with a phrase that I associate with your phrase. Exactly. An expression, an idiom. Let's go. Hold your horses. Oh my God. Hold your horses. Mm, cool as a cucumber. The cat's meow. Uh, don't buy a cat in a sack. <laughs> was that though? That was another one. Another Get out a cat know. of a sack. What's the idiom, the proverb? I don't know that one. It made me think of the, the bee's knees. The bee's knees. <laughs> Juicy secret. Ooh, spill the beans. Cup of tea. Not my cup of tea. <laughs> okay, okay, let me come up with something else. Mm, right up my alley. When the rubber meets the road. Mm, um, it's not a walk in the park. Do you say so? When oh, it's wow. difficult. Something difficult, yeah, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. To be tickled pink. Oh, I didn't know that. To be tickled pink. Is it tickled pink? Mm. Is it just to laugh out loud? Just when... No? Mm. I don't know <laughs> this expression. What does it mean? If you're tickled pink, you're... Something delights you. Tickles you pink. Very nice expressions to use in a conversation, maybe with a friend, which I think is a perfect way for us to segue into our main topic today. I think this is something that Kiseni and I were talking about and both of us got excited about because it's very close to our history with learning English or in my case, learning other languages. And this is something that traditional schools don't tend to talk about, which is that English really is this amazing tool, this amazing language. Like it or not, it's the global language and it 
is so incredible because it allows you, it's this key that all of a sudden can open up the power to be able to communicate with the entire world. And of course, everyone knows it's a global language and you need it for business and so on. So when we're saying that, we're not just saying, you know, it will allow you to get a job at an international company or it will allow you to move to a country where you can afford a better life, but rather that, well, there, I think there's two things here, actually. The first thing is just that all of a sudden you have access to much more information than most people have in their native language. I think actually compared to any language, there's most of the internet's in English. And the second thing, which I think is even more important, is it allows you to be able to communicate with anyone in the world. That's a bit of a, what would you call it, a, an exaggeration, but because not everyone in the world speaks English, of course, uh, but what we mean by that is that you can communicate with someone from almost any country. Any country you go to, you're going to find an English speaker who can help you out, or you know, if you go on the internet, you can meet people from all over the world, but you can only connect with them if you speak English, they probably don't speak. If you're from Brazil, you're native Portuguese or Ukrainian, mm -hmm. right? But it definitely so. like makes your own world bigger, right? You broaden your horizons. So what would you say, Ksenia, to those learners that might be learning mostly in isolation? They don't yet have friends or a community or a place where they can actively use their English every day. Remember, language is something very human, like language emerged for communication so you learn a language to communicate to connect to others and it's just like logical um to surround yourself with people uh who you can practice that language with it's just like it's so natural right and uh and it doesn't need to be like the whole community today we'll talk a little bit about communities right but it doesn't need to be even a community of a large number of people. Having one or two friends is already enough for that. It's just like, seems to me something very natural. Yes, you may f make your first steps in learning language on your own, but you won't keep your, I don't know, motivation, your passion for it if you're still doing it all on your own. You need someone. That's very true. What this makes me think about exactly what you're saying is that most people, most of us had instilled in us as kids, which that means that it was kind of like pushed into us in a forceful way that language is a school subject. It's something to be studied, but that's not at all the case. Language is something for communication. All of us learn our first language because basically so that we can communicate with our parents because it's much more effective to be able to tell them I want to eat a banana than it is to be you know, screaming or, the, you know, some other way trying to communicate to them that you're hungry and they don't know if it's because you're hungry or you have a tooth coming in or you have a dirty diaper or whatever the case is, right? That's why we learn our mother tongues. And from there, we learn foreign languages because we want to be able to, whatever opportunity it is that that other language is going to bring you. But we go through school studying it the same way that we're studying math and science and so on. So, we just feel like language is this thing that I have to memorize rules, take a test, and eventually, someday, I'm going to be able to use it to speak with people or not. You might just get so demotivated through your school, uh, through your school experience that you never actually come back to it. So I think we need to reprogram in our heads how we're perceiving language and seeing it more that it's not about speaking it perfectly. It's not about getting the grammar right. It's not about passing a test. It's about can we have a conversation? Can you and me connect right now in this moment? Yeah, and it also, it, it's not only about that. That's super important. And that's at the core, I think, of what language is all about, learning a language. But when learn, learning a language, we're all um, embarking on this kind of journey. And we don't want to be alone on those journeys. So having that community, having a friend or two to share this journey with, it's just like, opens up the whole bunch of opportunities for you. It's not only about motivation that I already referred to, right? It's also about accountability. It's also about like, practice. Learning a language involves like lots and lots of hours of practice. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's another thing that you can find in the community or with a friend. We as human beings, we always like to celebrate our achievements, whether big or small, and learning a language is a challenging thing, right, to do. And when we want to celebrate our achievements, yeah, we will go and 
talk to our friend and laugh with them together at something we learned or mistakes we made in English, or we ask for help, or we just like, I don't know, be complaining about those grammar rules that we can't get and maybe get help from our friends to, you know, to do it, to learn it, to remember it. That is so true. Think of my own experience that learning every language would be totally an uphill battle if I didn't have people close to me who, for one, they made me want to be better at speaking that language. They want, they made me want to be able to communicate at a higher level, to be able to speak my thoughts, to be able to have deeper conversations. And on the other hand, that supported my journey, that supported my learning. I wanted to just circle back because you used an expression I love. You said embark on a journey. What does that mean to embark on a journey? Basically, in simple words, it means to start a journey, to begin some activity, like learning a language, you start learning language. But embark is also about like you embark a ship, for example. So I think it comes from there. Nowadays, we mostly use it in the collocation that you perfectly used there. And you also used a nice expression, uphill battle. Oh, that's true. An uphill battle is it's basically something that you're going to lose. If you imagine you're pushing a huge boulder up a hill, it takes so much effort. So it's something that you're probably not going to be able to achieve. I recently watched a video where a guy just learned a language of his friend because he wanted to make a surprise. So he was visiting her on her graduation <laughs> day and she was speaking French. He was from the US, so he speaks English. And he had like 30 days until that event. Uh, and he like channeled himself to learn French to go and congratulate her, his friend on her graduation day. Did you have anything like that? Like when you wanted to learn a language because your friend spoke another language? I think most languages. I, I learned, I, I'm not fluent in French by any means, uh, certainly not nowadays, but I started learning French because I had uh, a friend who was half French in university. And that just motivated me spending time with her, spending time with friends of hers that would visit from France. And it's like, oh, you know, it'd be so cool to be able to speak to them in French. I don't think I ever got really to such a high level that I was able to do that so competently. And for me, Catalan too was very similar that most foreigners that move to Barcelona don't learn Catalan because you can get by with Spanish. You can communicate. Everyone is bilingual. So, But I learned it because I would be with a group of friends who were all Catalan and between themselves they would speak Catalan. And if I joined the conversation, they'd have to switch to Spanish for me. So I didn't want to be a reason that they had to switch the languages. So that was kind of my, my springboard, my jumping off point to start learning Catalan. Every time I travel somewhere, I try to learn some basic fra phrases, you know, to I'm the same. greet someone <laughs> on, like at the airport first, right? To say hello. Um, and then in the supermarket or in the street when I have to ask something or at the cafe too. I remember the first phrase I uh, learned in Italian when I was g going to visit Milan to meet our mm -hmm. real life English students there and you and Justin for the first time. Uh, the first phrase I learned in Italian was how to order a cup of coffee, an espresso in Italian. I don't remember it now, mm -hmm. but I, you know, mastered it before going to Milan. <laughs> Un cappuccino, por favore. Oh, something like that. <laughs> I had a similar experience that I went to Italy and I was ordering a coffee. I didn't know how to say milk, so I was trying to figure out how to describe milk. And I was like, they're like mooing to try to get them to understand <laughs> what milk is. So yeah. It can be good to learn some of those basics before traveling to the country. I What you were saying too, it reminded me, I wanted to point out two things that that reminded me of too, just the learning a language for someone. So Berlitz, I believe it was, had this beautiful commercial that they did that was, it was an old man, an old Polish man, I believe, learning English. And you see him kind of practicing and different in the bathtub and while he's doing different things and so on. And you think it's just like, oh, it's this person is learning. And then, you know, they'll probably say what method he was using or something. But there's a beautiful reveal at the end of the commercial that he he's grabbing a flight. He's arriving in the United Kingdom. And then he arrives, you see, at his his son or daughter's house. And he's able to greet his grandchildren, who I'm not sure if they speak Polish, in English. So it's this really nice thing. Actually, we have this similar story in our fluency circle. Hiro, our 17-year-old really? student, 
learns English to communicate with his uh, half American grandchildren. Oh, that's so yeah. sweet. The other one, I'm not sure if you've seen the movie Love Actually. That there's there's a whole story within there. There's the guy who learns Portuguese. Yeah. yeah. And you see at the end too, like she was learning English, also motivated by him. So it doesn't necessarily need to be for love, but that helps too, right? As a motivator for learning the language. That's about like exactly having friends and having a strong motivation, strong why, why you want to learn a language. Yeah. Uh, that can be different for different people. It's not necessarily that you want to go abroad or you have grandchildren, you know, speaking English, but it's just like, it also adding like a sense of community, a sense of belonging. Uh, like, for example, um, when you find a language learning community, you can then discover that you surrounded surrounded yourself with like-minded people and you have so many topics to talk about in English. So you have like, you know, two sides to it, like you're practicing language, but you also learn about some amazing things from different people, yeah, that you wouldn't know uh, hadn't you, you know, joined that club. That's very true. It can be immensely powerful. You mentioned the Fluency Circle, which is our community of learners, which unfortunately right now is more or less closed to the public. But we are looking to, in the future, we're such big believers in the power of community to learn languages. In fact, it's how Real Life English started was we were doing events in Belarusanchi, Brazil, for people to come together at bars and speak English together. And it was this amazing thing to, it was how I actually first got involved because it just blew me away. Being in Belarusanchi, which is not a particularly, particularly touristic city, and walking to a bar and just hearing a hundred Brazilians all speaking English to each other. And that's why we included it in our course as a core feature is, is the community. Ksenia mentioned that we met with some community members also in Milan a few years ago. For sure in the future, we'll be building onto the Real Life English app. So you definitely should download that if you have not already. It's absolutely free. You can be listening to this podcast and getting all of the most important expressions with vocabulary flashcards so you never forget them. And of course, we're talking about not learning in a bubble, so not feeling isolated and lonely in your learning. So you can go on there on the Global Speak anytime that you're feeling a bit lonely, press a button, instantly connect with another English speaker in another part of the world, discover other cultures, ask them about their day, and so on. It's much better than, maybe we could talk about other social media, but it's much better, I think, than other social media, which is actually exacerbating these feelings of loneliness. Like, uh, it's, There's actually been studies that it's creating throughout society more feelings of loneliness, depression, anxiety. And it's so weird, right? In the yeah. uh, in the period of our lives when we have so many tools for connection, we still feel lonely, exactly that, yeah. right? And this, like you use the word loneliness, it just like uh, reminded me of that beautiful saying uh, that no man is an island. And uh, it, it's it's such a beautiful metaphor because actually we as human beings we are wired. Uh, right to, to to get to be connected to build those bonds. It's just like important for I don't know for everything for our species, <laughs> right? For our survival, even. And with more and more, I can't say development, but somehow in the recent years, there's been more focus on personal space, individual achievements, like this. Um, me time, I don't know. It's more focused on your ego rather than the community. And like you also started to talk about it, I think later today we'll uh, listen to an audio on this topic, right? That mm -hmm. you do feel that fulfillment, you, you achieve a sense of fulfillment through helping others, through belonging to a community, through serving people around you, right? Maybe that's a good excuse for us to watch that now, actually. So this is from Simon Sinek, and it's a video I watched, actually, it came from a, a speech, and we just have the, the audio here for those of you are, that are listening. But it came from a speech where he was talking about this human need for connection. And it's really something that now, more than ever, we are hungry for, we're starving for, because many of us... Like you said, there's so many of these tools for connecting, but it's not a type of connection that actually satisfies 
our human need for community. Before we start listening, do you want to define some words? Yeah, let's do that because it'll help you all to better understand the audio. So there is this, I don't know, extinct animal mentioned <laughs> at the very beginning of the audio. Uh, it's called saber-toothed tiger. I believe many of us mm -hmm. know what it is from cartoons at least. So um, that's a um, prehistoric tiger, to simply mm -hmm. say it. But saber is an English word that you can still use nowadays because it's a heavy sword, you know, this with a curved blade. So mm -hmm. saber toothed is like this tiger was named because of the shape of the tooth, right? There's also like lightsabers in Star Wars. Ah. <laughs> People might be familiar with that. Uh, and Ethan, I wanted to ask you, do you use, uh, do you often use this emphasizer like damn, pretty damn amazing, pretty damn good? Yeah, I think it's one that we use a lot. Like, that was damn amazing. That was damn incredible. Uh, or even maybe if you have some, this is some damn good ice cream, for example. But depending who you're with, Damn is sort of a curse word, so you can say dang if you want to make it softer, if you're around kids or you're around your partner's grandmother or something like this, and you're you're not wanting to use something that could be offensive, or even at work, right? You could say this is some pretty dang good ice cream. Okay. Another word that comes here is amplify. So to amplify is to increase, yeah, to make something mm -hmm. larger. And... Another word is bunch, bunch of people. So a bunch of people is a group of people. Uh, another interesting phrase for you, Ethan, mind your own business. Is it a derogative phrase or is it okay, again, to use with your not so close friends? It depends. So if you're using it as like an order and you have a harsh tone, it's like mind your own business, then it sounds quite harsh and offensive, right? But... The way he used it here, he's actually saying that you're minding your own business. So if you use it in that sense as, I think it'd be like an adverb, uh, you're minding your own business, it means that you're just doing your thing. You're not bothering anyone. Nice. We're not good at everything. We're not good by ourselves. You know, if I send you out to go fight a saber-toothed tiger by yourself, odds are tiger one, you zero. <laughs> It's not going to go very well. But if you go out as a group, We're pretty damn amazing. And the reason is, is because we all have our certain strengths and we all have our certain weaknesses. And the goal is not to fix your weaknesses. The goal is to amplify your strengths and surround yourself with the people who can do what you can't do. But it's not just based on skills and, and application and experience. It's based on what you believe. It's based on what you believe. You see, simply being good at something and having somebody else being good at what you're no good at does not mean you will trust each other. Trust. The sense of trust comes from the sense of common values and common beliefs. I can prove it. How many of you are from New York? Okay, a bunch of you. Are you friends with everybody in New York? Why not? Why not? But when you go to Los Angeles and you meet someone from New York, you're like, hey, I'm from New York, and you're best friends. <laughs> right? And when you go to France, you're there you are in the Paris metro, minding your own business, and you hear an American accent behind you, and you turn around, and you say, hey, where are you from? They say Los Angeles. You're like, hey, I'm from New York. And you're best friends. <laughs> Because when you're surrounded by people who don't believe what you believe, when you're in a strange environment where you don't feel comfortable, you look for anyone who may share some of the same values and beliefs that you have, and you start to form a very real and very intense bond with them, simply because you know that they have a basic understanding of how you grew up, of the things that you care about, of the life that you live back home. So this is so interesting what he says, Ksenia, about finding people with common values and beliefs. That's a way to grow trust. And he's using it in the context of finding someone who's from the same culture as you, which can be one way of doing that. It's, it's a shortcut, right? Something in preparing for this conversation that I was thinking about is how culture really is one type of community. It's like a very, very big community, depending on how large the culture is. I don't think it necessarily needs to be just someone who comes from the same country as you. There's so many different ways that we can build those similar beliefs and values. And nowadays, sometimes even, this was my case <laughs> for sure, is like something about American beliefs and values does not fit with me as well as beliefs and values from certain other places. And that's one of the reasons that I don't live in the United States because it just doesn't, something for me just doesn't fit there. And 
you don't necessarily need to move abroad though to find this. Like a lot of times our tribe, the people who have those beliefs or values that are very similar to our own, they might be on the other side of the world and you might be able to find ways to communicate or connect with them online, right? Yeah, nowadays, like we talk about the tools that are available. So there are so many platforms where you can actually find your online communities. I think you brought some of them to share with our students, right? What are the ways people like, for example, living in small towns, small cities can find those communities? Because like talking about me, I was lucky to find uh, an offline community here in my city uh, by just scrolling the Instagram feed once I stumbled upon this very beautiful video. And the ambience of the whole place just like lured me in and I was so resolute to join them one day. So this is a speaking club in English. So I was just, just lucky to serendipitously, uh, serendipitously <laughs> find them just online. And again, it's talking about like digital world. We talk so much about downsides of it, but actually there are so, so many things that we wouldn't be able to do without it. Yeah, I did take notice of some of these in preparation for having this conversation because you can meet people online or offline and maybe some people who came here, came just for this reason because they want to connect with more people, but they're not sure how. And... I actually wrote several years back an uh, article on our blog called Four Ways to Speak English in Your City. Mm -hmm. So we can link that mm -hmm. in the show notes in the description for people if they want to check it out. One that I've used a lot myself is couchsurfing. Mm -hmm. So I use this, actually, I first was introduced to it when I lived in Mallorca because my roommates, uh, they had couchsurfed, traveled by couchsurfing, and then they wanted to host people. So we actually hosted people from all over the place in our apartment. You know, when you go into a hotel and you have no clue who is who, couch surfing is a bit different. If you come to my place, you get to know me, you get to know my friends and family, you get to know the activities I do. But then when I started traveling more, I used it myself, which is a great option if you don't have money. And then I found I could actually use this as a tool to meet people to practice languages. So I used this when I was living in Brazil, I was learning French, and I actually made someone who's still a good friend of mine there who's from France. Um, I met um, when I was in Chile as well, and I didn't want to lose my Catalan. I met some people from Catalonia there and made made friends that way. So that was a really great tool. I know that since COVID, it's no longer free. It's not I checked and it's not very expensive, but it is something to keep in mind. And I'm not sure if that has hurt at all the how active of a community it is. And they also do in-person events mm. in big cities. It's pretty simple to find them online right now. Yeah. We have uh, one I use here in Barcelona a lot is Meetup. So there's all sorts of different communities on there. And you can, you know, see what things are happening during the week. You can join different groups and see when their next meetups are. So that, that's something I would recommend checking if it's in your city. Otherwise, there's like you said, there's speaking clubs. So maybe people can even just google speaking club in their city and see if there's one like it's amazing because you're not from you're not you're not in kiev right you're in a smaller city in ukraine and yet there's still something like this that exists yeah yeah uh, what helps me here as well like in a smaller city i live is subscribing to um, instagram accounts that are uh your of your local city accounts Mm -hmm. uh, or public groups from your city, or even not even like influencers, but like socially active people in your city. They always like post stories or feeds uh, about something, what's going on in your city. So it's the easiest and the simplest way to learn what's going on and to join, jump in that event. There's also Facebook groups similarly. This is something I've used in the past. And I believe now more people use Instagram at least younger people use Instagram more than Facebook, right? But something I was even considering, for example, I was wanting to meet more Brazilians here. Still have this on my to-do list, but looking for like Brazilians in Barcelona, for example, to see if there's any events posted there or different ways that I can meet more Brazilians here in Barcelona. For example, I think actually this came from a friend, friend of a friend who saw it on uh, Instagram, but we went to... It was in August, I believe, to a samba here in Barcelona. And that was amazing because it's just like almost everyone there was Brazilian. So you might be able to find things like that 
cultural events. By the way, Ethan, let me come back a little bit. Uh, we were just talking about so many platforms, tools existing right now for forming communities, joining communities. But back in the day when you just uh, uh, organized the real life movement in Brazil in Belo Horizonte, I don't believe you had so many tools. Facebook, maybe. How did you turn it into a movement? It was Facebook. We had a Facebook group that became very popular, first in Belarusanchi, and then it expanded to the world. And in fact, we had people asking, like, can you do these events in my city or can I do one of these events? And we had some people that did local events in their city. So that was really amazing to see how it how it grew and everything. And and in fact, like again, if you are on the Really Fingish app, we're adding new features all the time. And this is something that we kind of have on our vision board of things for having on the app in the future is helping people to connect in person and maybe even to start uh, real life English events in their city because it's something that we would love to come back to at some point. That would be amazing. There were some examples of connected speech I wanted to point out because those were really interesting ones. So at the very beginning of the audio, he said like this sentence again with that prehistoric tiger set. Uh, he started, you know, if I send you out to fight a saber-toothed tiger, he pronounces these words uh, very quickly so that uh, it even you don't uh, hear the word if. It, it, it sounds like, you know, vi, like, you know, vi send you, you know, vi send you out. So off turns into of, like schwa sound plus v, but it almost disappears after you know, you know, vi send you out. Right. And there is this new sound appears between D sound and Y. It often happens in the collocation of these two letters. Send you becomes send you, send you out. Right. Yeah. That if I, that is pretty common that we'll just reduce it to phi. And there is this difference that learners very often are challenged with. And you made a whole lesson on it difference between can and can't. Right. So there is this phrase. Um, with the people who can do what you can do, right? So the in first can, there is schwa sound, who can do, who can do. And there is a broad a sound in the can't. Yeah, you can do. So that's how we differentiate between them. But he used a stop T there, right? So it's can't, yeah. can't like a, a glottal T actually that's in the back of the throat. So that's what tricks learners up is because they... If you don't have that glottal sound in your language, then you're probably not going to hear it and you can train yourself to hear it. But really what the secret there of understanding the difference between can and can't, you can check out the whole video that I did, of course, which we can link in the description and the show notes, but is that can usually gets reduced to kun and can, even though that T sound almost disappears, always maintains that long eh sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I really like this next one. A bunch of you, bunch of you. So the group of people he uh, refers to as a bunch of you, he pronounces bunch of you. Fantastic. So should we watch the second clip? And we can also, this is a, now I'm not exactly remembering, I think around 10 minutes audio and it's, it's really fantastic. So recommend you guys check it out. We can link that in the description or show notes, but we just pulled a couple of small clips that we thought were relevant to today's topic, right? Mm -hmm. There's just a few words that would be good to define. So he would say in the audio, we legitimately trust each other. So legitimately, to me, it sounds a little bit like legal, but it has two meanings. First one, in a way that can be defended with logic or justification. But here, it, he uses it rather informally, uh, meaning like genuinely, truly trusting each other right? And there's a beautiful phrase, look out for each other. What does it mean? Oh yeah, look out for each other means that you have each other's back. So that's using another idiom to describe it, but that you support each other, you can count on each other, you'll be there if the other person needs help or assistance. I did want to circle back though to legitimately, I don't know if you know, there's a slang use where we just say legit. Legit. So, and it comes from this more informal meaning of being genuine or true, but we use it for being that something is really high quality mm. almost so you say uh, maybe i just saw Don dune 2 and it was legit uh -huh. okay about a restaurant you visited yeah they have some legit food mm. cool nice there you go good, good to know 
Uh, okay, another word, fulfillment. We mentioned it today, right? Fulfillment is a feeling of happiness or satisfaction. And a nice, interesting phrase, put yourself out there. Would you define it, Ethan? Put yourself out there. Of course. If you put yourself out there, you're putting yourself in a vulnerable situation. So a situation where you're, there is some degree of risk or failure, but a lot of times that's where the best things are. So if you go on the Real Life English app and you're pressing that button, you're going to have a conversation with someone. You're putting yourself out there because you'll probably make mistakes. You might feel a bit embarrassed, but also on the other side of that, you're going to be speaking, you're going to be improving your speaking skills. You'll get more confident at being able to communicate with other people. So I'd say that it's a legit way to practice your English and become more confident and natural. <laughs> nice. So let's watch it now. And when we can find the people who believe what we believe, we're weirdly drawn to them because our very survival depends on it. We need it. And so the more you can give of yourself, the more you can give of what you believe, the more you can discipline, with discipline, say and, and do the things you actually believe, strange things start to happen. Just like on that metro in Paris, simply because of one tiny little symbol that was put out there, that we are from the same place, we may have the same values, we may have the same beliefs, we're drawn to each other and we legitimately trust each other, and more, important, more importantly, we'll look out for each other. And that's the key to all of this. If we're willing to give to the person next to us, it's amazing what they'll be willing to give to us. And again, our very survival depends on this. We need to trust each other. and We're more willing to trust somebody who's willing to help us. I hate the whole self-help industry, right? How can you be happy? What are the five steps you can follow to be a millionaire? What are the seven steps that you need to get the career that you want? You know, me, 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 me. What about helping the guy next to you? What are the five steps that you can do to help the person next to you lose some weight? What are the seven steps that you can follow to help the person next to you find the job that they want? Do you know how we get fulfillment? You can be happy because you did things at work. You can be proud because you did things at work. You can be excited because you had a big success at work. But do you know how you feel fulfilled at work? When you do something for someone else. It's the only way we get that feeling. It's the only way we get that feeling. You know why the statistics say that over 90% of people don't feel fulfilled by the work they do? It's not because of the job, it's not because of the pay, it's not because of the benefits. It's because we don't help each other anymore. We sit in our cubes and we work. And anything that we turn to anybody is because we need something, we need to get something. And yet we don't put ourselves out there simply for no other reason than to help somebody else. I did something for him, why won't he help me? It's not an equation. It's designed to help you feel good. And Mother Nature has given us this feeling when we do something for someone else to encourage us to do it. Because when we are in groups, when we are surrounded by people who believe what we believe, trust emerges and our very survival and progress goes up. Amazing. So I did want to circle back to what I hinted at earlier about how culture really is like this big community. And I think it's worthwhile for especially people who might want to move abroad to another city, but to spend a little bit of time getting to know that culture, because it really is this secret code that helps you to connect on a deeper level with people from that country. And it doesn't just have to be with native speakers. It could be anyone. Like maybe you made a really good friend in Italy. And so you want to connect with them on a deeper level. It's like get to know Italian culture, because all of a sudden you'll have this same language. You'll be wearing the same hat like he talks about, you know, with hearing the other person from your country on the Paris Metro, that there's this instant connection. So it doesn't just have to be with someone who's a, a native speaker or someone who's from your same country. Yeah, that's true. When he was talking about this sense of fulfillment and when applying it to English learning, uh, English learning, mm, on our app, people can meet uh, students, learners of English of different level, right? And sometimes they tell us like, but I have a high level of English. So I want to meet people with high level of English. And what we try to communicate through the app, through communication with the users who reach out to us uh, is that when you meet people with a low level of English, you have that unique chance, unique opportunities to help them learn something, right? Through teaching, you are learning more, you gain more confidence. And you don't know, you make 
serve that other person and you can make their day. Yeah, you can really help them out on their learning English. You can motivate another person to learn more, to, you know, to be satisfied that they went out of their comfort zone and with their low level of English, they, you know, gathered courage and made that call to connect to you. And you can learn so much from that experience too by helping out another person. And it really is, even if you're not an advanced level already, there's always someone who's a lower level than you and who you can help. We all know something that other people don't know. There's an expression I really love that says, I never met a man so ignorant that he couldn't teach me something. So even if that person doesn't teach you about English, they might teach you about something really cool from their part of the world, or they might work in something that they can tell you something really interesting about. So I think that curiosity, we talked about this last week with Izzy too, but curiosity is just this really underrated skill that is so important because you might think that this person is uninteresting or there's no reason for you to connect with them or their English is worse than you so they can't help you to improve. But if you have a bit of curiosity, you might learn something yeah. really unexpected. Yeah. What I often think about is also sometimes it feels like, oh, I already know so much not only about English, but it's just like, I really read a lot, I watch a lot, I learn, but what I don't know is other people's perspectives on the same things I know. So for example, mm -hmm. it never ceases to amaze me when I um, participate in those speaking clubs um, is how sometimes our similar thoughts intertwine. And on the other hand, how unique all of our perspectives are like from you, you like someone when well, there is a question and i already know this the answer and i think about it from this point of view but suddenly someone just finds and opens for me just completely different side of that question and that's why i think i'm drawn to those meetings because it helps me to learn more about other people and about myself I think that's been one of the most fulfilling parts for me as well. And I have been so fortunate to get to travel a lot and to get to connect to other people, but also through Real Life English, I've connected with thousands, tens of thousands, even learners from all over the world. And there's so many things that I've learned about so many different countries that, you know, I only have had the the fortune to to get to learn and to discover and everything because I'm a part of this big community that we created, this community of real lifers, this community of global citizens. So yeah, I think that that's really well said. I, I really like too, like what you were saying earlier, it reminded me of the golden rule, which is, and this relates to what Simon Sinek was saying as well, the golden rule, uh, as we often refer to it in English, is do unto others as you wish to be done unto you, which is a formal old way of saying it, and a more modern way of saying it is treat others as you wish to be treated. So when you were a basic learner or an intermediate learner, you probably would have loved someone to be patient, to help you out, to give you a tip that helped them when they were at your level. So it's like, okay, now you're at that more advanced level, pay it forward, help someone else out. And those communities, people are very supportive and you can find that support mm -hmm. in the communities, right? Most definitely. So Ksenia, I think we could talk about this all day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously it's a topic that's near and dear to both of our hearts. We've used a lot of different vocab and expressions. There were so many nice ones that you used here that we won't have the time to define right now. But if you are wanting to learn more vocabulary and expressions so you can understand more advanced conversations, then and you're not on the Real Life English app, then you have to head over there. Get the vocabulary flashcards so you never forget these new words. And that said, let's jump into what we're digging this week. Okay, Ethan, so let me share with you this TV show on Netflix I've been binge watching lately. It's called The Resident Alien. Mm. And uh, it's a drama comedy, more to the comedy, I guess. It's a sci fi. You could say a dramedy. Dramedy. Oh, I like how English <laughs> likes to, you know, combine words. <laughs> uh, and it's about this extraterrestrial creature. Uh, that crashed in a very small town in Colorado in the middle of nowhere. And uh, the funny thing here is that his mission on Earth is to kill all the humanity, but he's disguised as a human doctor. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's so absurd, 
but in a good way. Like, I mean, this actor, Alan Tudyk, I think he was born for this role. You just like, even if not the whole <laughs> season, but you should watch the pilot episode. Like, I highly recommend it. It's so hilarious. And I think the humor there is not this type of, how do you call that? Run of the mill. Yeah, just like simple, mm -hmm. not, you know, stupid jokes. It's really kind. And it's so... The, the the pilot and the whole season one is just like filled with those heartfelt moments and you laugh and you just smile and it warms your heart. But yeah, just like I, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, but you know what uh, drew me to this, um, to watching the whole season in mm -hmm. the pilot is that the main character is this alien was actually using real life way our method <laughs> to learn english really like that's crazy yeah he was uh watching this series the tv show law and order a good mystery figuring out what happened like law and order <laughs> he was just like watch a scene rewind it a bunch of times and just try to shadow to mimic uh, after the characters. And uh, yeah, you should watch it. It's like, at first he sounds just like mumbling and then they show like that like he speak normal English. <laughs> That's what That's made amazing. me watch, you know, the whole season, just this method we were Learn using. Learn English with Law and Order. We haven't done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so what I wanted to share is that I've been digging and I thought it could relate it to today's topic is i've been really digging rock climbing i think i've mentioned this on the podcast i've been doing it for approximately six months now with a sojourn with like a pause in the middle because i, I had to have a surgery of course so i had to take a break for some weeks but that's a bit of a tangent but I brought this up because actually last week i got to go climbing with some new friends and i actually met them because it was on an app for meeting other people who want to practice sports. And so I found some people that want to go climbing. So that was really amazing that like we went climbing together and then had some tapas after. And the reason I thought this would be fun to share as well is because uh, one of them is a Brazilian. So I, I had like a vested interest here to also be practicing my Portuguese. But I think that there there's a great, that's a great thing because you don't need to look for people an English learning community necessarily, or uh, English language exchange partner, or uh, whatever, a native who's going to help you. The best way possible is to find a community, find a group, find a forum, or find individuals who want to do something that's not related to English or not related to the language you want to learn with you, but you'll be using your English for that thing. So I think that that's like the best possible way to go about it. I've had countless people write to me saying like, oh, can you help me with my English? Just because they want a native to help them. But you're probably not going to get very many people to say, yes, I want to spend my free time helping you to improve your English with no possible benefit for me. But you can find people who have similar interests to you or the same hobby and actually do something fun together and you'll be practicing your English. That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Maybe it's not possible to do in a small city where you don't have so many foreigners, but you're lucky you live in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's a, uh, you know. Yeah. You might have to be a bit creative. You might have to do online. Like most gamers have really good English because they play a lot of video games online and English tends to be the global language. There, yeah. Right? Another thing I thought of is uh, to be a uh, local city tour guide and post an advertisement mm -hmm. online right like so anytime any foreigner happen to you know cross uh your country your small city your small town you know, they could find you and you'll be able to help them and practice your english doesn't dan from our community from vietnam do that that's what dan is doing right yeah <laughs> he's like making um he's met a lot of people food right? tour for them and just showing uh city for tourists yeah that's what he's doing could be a way to make some extra cash as well you never know if you get good at it all right ksenia well it's been absolutely lovely i think we're gonna have to do another episode especially if you guys want another episode if there's like a specific question you have about community about making friends about what to talk about with these people that you're meeting and so on leave us a comment on youtube or send us an email at hello at reallifeglobal.com and we might just do an episode on that. 
Uh, and remember that if you are enjoying these episodes, a free way for you to support us so we can continue bringing you better and better content is by giving us a five-star review wherever you're listening to this. So that could be Spotify or Apple Podcasts, or if you're on YouTube, giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, because this really does help us to reach more people. And of course, I think it's never better said than with this topic that no matter what divides us, that which unites us is far greater. One, two, three. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so dear global citizens, today we are going to be doing something a little bit different. You will be learning with a learner just like you, but who has achieved an incredible native-like level in English. So my guest today is our content manager here at Real Life English, Izzy Mignot. We're trying to help people understand each other, literally and figuratively. What's the whole story? So maybe we could just start from the beginning. How did you get started learning English? I think there's two answers to that. So Izzy is a Brazilian from Recife, but most people are super impressed when he speaks English because he sounds just like a native from the United States. That's when I noticed like, I, man, like this is in English, so maybe I can learn it. 